Hey everybody, welcome to Obscurities in Miniatures, and it's Friday, which means I bring yet another Obscurity in Literature. And today I have on the table one of the coolest RPGs that I still have yet to ever play, and that is Splicers from Palladium Books by Carmen Belair. So, I'm not even sure how this one got in my viewfinder. I, I don't know. Um... I mean, for me, Palladium Books, uh, and this is a true story, actually, my interest in RPGs really predates a lot of my comic book and video game collecting and interest. Uh, I remember I got my first D&D &D books, like official, the old orange hardbacked spine books, probably in elementary school. Maybe somewhere around 4th, 5th, 6th grade. By 6th grade for sure, because I know I probably had the Oriental Adventures book. That was my, oh, I loved that book. And they had, like, the cool, like, full-page spread of, like, all the different armors and all the fancy Japanese names. I had absolutely no idea what any of that stuff was at that time. Uh, but, yeah, that, that definitely kindled an interest that was probably already there, because I think I got my, my first book on Samurai back in, like, 4th grade or something. But anyway, I, I digress. That's totally unrelated to this. Um... On a trip, on a vacation, probably in either the late 80s or the early 90s, and probably Sparkle Trout will jump in here and remind me when, um, we were at a bookstore on vacation, and I'm pretty sure it was a B. Dalton, and they had the Palladium Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles RPG. And so, obviously, I mean, I was familiar with D&D, &D, and I had all the books and memorized all the useless stats and can tell you how many experience points you needed to get from this level to that, uh, but I never really played, because if anything, I was always the person who was going to end up having to be the DM, and I always wanted to be the cool, heroic leader of the party, and that usually wasn't the case. Uh, usually, I'd end up getting to be a supportive type role, or I'm the one running the game, and I never wanted to do that. I think that's why I kind of gravitated more towards the tabletop miniature wargaming stuff, skirmish games, because at least then, not only could I help craft the story of the events, uh, but I can also have a bit of a more, you know, dramatic and important role in what was going on on the table. While I sip coffee here. So, yeah, when I got that TMNT book, uh, it really blew my mind away as somebody who is all about memorizing stats and crunching numbers uh the palladium books for me were at seventh heaven at that point and i distinctly remember the day that the original first edition of riffs came out and it absolutely blew my young teenaged mind and splicers really seems to kind of follow in that tradition just looking at the cover you have this dude in a funky bio-organic combat suit with flamethrowers blasting some funky, clunky, old, rusted-up chunker of a robot with multiple limbs. I'm like, sign me up. This is exactly my type of book. Um, and while I may not ever get a chance to play a lot of these games, for me, uh, it was always about just, like, digging in and absorbing all of that background material that these books, especially older RPGs, really seem to have in spades. Uh, I know some of my favorites were the original Iron Kingdoms books before they became Privateer Press when it was still kind of in the open D20 stuff. And those books, I mean, they're just like massive encyclopedias all about the Iron Kingdoms. And for somebody who was really into War Machine, you know, especially during second edition, uh, before it got too number crunchy. It was really cool just how much of that stuff going back so far they'd really kept, you know, a real good understanding of. So, you know, upon pop and open the book, science, oh, you can't even see it here. Let me slide the camera back. Splicers is a science fiction and horror role playing game. And I believe this is a very similar warning here at the top, much like the Rifts series would have and I remember being so worried about when I first got that Riffs book like oh man my parents are gonna kill me I mean I think they bought it for me 
it was probably around Christmas or something. And it, most likely, knowing me, I probably asked for it as a gift from like my grandparents who were usually oblivious to the things that I was interested in, or absolutely encouraged. And my, my grandmother has always been a big fan of monsters and the supernatural and things like that. So she probably would have been all for it anyway. Violence, war, magic, and the supernatural. So yeah, uh, looks a little bit different, but this shocked me when I got this book. We have what looks to be Kevin Siembieda's and Carmen Belair's autographs in the book. And I don't know if that's in everybody's book, because I know sometimes, you know, they'd have those kind of, you know, like Xerox manufactured signatures. But it looks like, because there's like little ink smears on Siembieda's name, maybe they did actually sign it. And that's interesting that somebody was willing to part with this. I mean, obviously, it's a little bit worn around the edges. A little bit yellowed and coffee stained or water stained or whatever the case may be here. Uh, but to me, that's kind of cool. It makes me kind of sad that somebody had to part with this. But then I remember I've, I've had to part with quite a few. Well, I, I shouldn't say have to, but stupidly parted with quite a few autographed things. One of my worst being a early book by uh, Yasuhisa Nirosawa, who did a bunch of like monster designs for a ton of stuff. Uh, one of his early books with a big full page illustrated sketch that he did on the interior cover and I kicked myself so much for that. Yeah, I may have got a nice chunk of change, but that was a damn cool book. I mean, this is too. Not on the same level as Nirasawa, you know, early work and original sketches, but still damn cool. So if you're not familiar with a lot of the Palladium books, um, you'll learn really fast that they're just full of stuff very much so to the point where it is kind of overwhelming and at least with like the the tmnt and the riffs books i had spent so much time as a kid pouring over those because obviously in the days before the internet uh you know we didn't have instant access to stuff so and i didn't have piles well no i had piles and piles of books but we all have those certain books that we always come back to, and, and those were definitely two of them. Uh, but yeah, you learned where everything was. And I'm assuming this could too. But again, one of the things that I really enjoy about these are just the thick chunks of background lore. The fluff, if you will. Uh, to me, it's really interesting. You have this whole crazy supercomputer thing going on. But like, look, we're barely into the story of it. And we're already getting into, like, stats and how everything's going to work. And it's like, we're barely not even ten pages in. And it's just text upon text. So then we get into, well, then we start getting into how to bend reality and go into the other game systems that Palladium is known for doing. Rift's the most famous of the ones genre jumping. So this is really interesting. We have this big supercomputer. We've got nanobot plagues. We've got the world in absolute ruin because of these nanobot swarms that people can't go and touch anything made out of metal. It'll activate all the nanobots and they're dead meat at that point. Again, we're still just going into all of the background text of what's going on in the world. And we get some nice, big, cool spreads of very gritty sci-fi art. Very coalition-looking dudes there with semi-skull masks. It's like a mixture of the Soga King mask and some one of those coalition vehicles. That's always fun with these, is let's, let's spot the artistic influence, right? This ship later on shows up, and those arms just make me think of uh, Outlaw Star. So yeah, we have the main enemy, and it has multiple personalities, which I think was something we saw similar with, uh, what was it called? I know there was one of those, there was a big supercomputer in Rifts that I think had something similar. So yeah, you have the different aspects of Nexus, the big bad. And then we have, of course, stats for every single one of them. So if you wanted to fight every single one of them. But they don't give us all of the combat bonuses. And then we get into the actual robots of Nexus. The Necroborgs being cool ones where it's like uh, 
I want to say this is like the leftover remains that the nanobots have inhabited or just collect the pieces of to go after the heroes. Shades of Bubblegum Crisis. And then we have crazy mechs like this kind of guy. I don't know what it is, but it looks cool. The Assault Slayer. Battle Track. And I mean, I will admit, these are absolutely a guilty pleasure for me. Just to, This is like one of those books I'll absolutely pull off the shelf every now and then just to read the descriptions of these machines. And I mean, there's just like so much detail. I love it. And then like all these weird statistics on it. You know, how much cargo? What's the width? What's the height? How fast can they swim? Because why not, right? You need to know those speeds. I guess if you have, like, superhumans and you want to, you know, outpace them or something. The horror factor, senses and features, number of melee attacks, combat bonuses, skills of notes. And then we get into all the various weapon systems. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay. The flying strike ship. I don't know. Do you guys see a bit of an Outlaw Star influence or is it just me? But then again, that... The... The tail, I don't know, with the thruster right there and those kind of adjustable vernier looking thingies makes me think, there's a dropship I'm thinking of that looked like that. What year did this come out? This came out like 2004, so this is like in a post-Halo world, isn't it? Is it one of the Halo dropships I'm thinking of? I don't know. The Soga King Skull Probe. In a world before drones. See, one thing that I always loved about the Palladium books was they always had cool art. There may have been a lot of other questionable things, both in the book and behind the scenes, but there absolutely was neat stuff to look at. Absolutely some eye candy. Shades of Macross, maybe? The Slicer Robot. Hover Platforms? And again, just cool looking artwork. And we haven't even got into, oh, okay. I think we're starting to get into, we're almost like 60 pages in. And we're just now starting to get into some of the heroes of note. And then I want to say around this point, we start talking about the whole splicer thing. Yeah. Splicer technology and how to roll up your host armor. So that's the whole thing is you have these very Henshin Tokusatsu hero type guys. And, I mean, obviously, this is very much inspired by the Giver, and I'm all for that. We need more Giver-inspired things, both on the tabletop and in media. Come on, even, like, the little mouthpiece is very Giver-ish. Even the way the eyes look is very Giver-ish. Like, some of, like, the gym things, the Mega Smasher he's got. So you have, like, this whole section here on how you can roll up your armor, how it's powered... How you wear it, what kind of things, you know, can regenerate it. It's just fun stuff. And this goes on for a good 40, 50 pages, I'd say, of just how to build your armor. And then you can have some of the creatures like the behemoth here tagging along to help you. Because, if you, you know, after spending so much time rolling up your character, you're going to need a mount. Like Death Gidra. With Kiryu heads. Look at those. It's totally Kiryu heads. On oh, Death Gidra body. But you know what? I ain't gonna complain. It's nicer looking than anything I did. Horses? Who wants a horse? I want a synthetic horse. Mega horse. That's what I need. So yeah, again, we're just getting into all kinds of crazy. It's just like a catalog. Like a catalog of cool stuff for your characters. I love these kinds of pages. These these were some of my favorite things to stare at. Not this book necessarily, but pages like this in old RPG books. Video game manuals. Come on. It's like I love stuff like that. Look at this dude. Totally out of place. There were always like some pieces of Riff's artwork I remember that looked like totally... Somebody spent way more of their time and budget drawing that one piece than everything else. 
And finally, over like 150 pages into the book, we're going to start getting into the actual character classes that you can play as. I mean, it's just like we spent so much time talking about all the cool stuff you can use. And then we get into how to, you know, the game mechanics start on page 168. And then we're back to character creation. So that's what I say when the books are very hard to hop through. I mentioned that at the beginning of this video. You have to really get to know the book to know where everything is. And I know a lot of people ended up having to tab the crap out of these things. The experience point system, which is like a leftover from all of the other Palladium games. And all the crazy skills. If you like making lists of skills, then we get into all of the various skills and explanations of everything. It's like, there isn't a whole lot of meat behind the gameplay. Which is a shame, I guess, if this was like your very first tabletop RPG. And then a whole section on hand-to-hand -hand combat and what you're going to do. The various types of hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's what I remember. Basic, expert, assassin, martial arts, commando. You got your ranged combat. So it's like, we've got all this cool material. And yeah, there is a game buried in there. But to me, it's like, I don't know. I'm always of two minds. It's like, do I want to actually play the game the way that the author intended, or do I want to take all that cool stuff and streamline it and make it into something more accessible that I could actually get to the table? And I'm all, like I said, I'm always torn of two minds uh, because there's just so much neat stuff, at least in my opinion. This is absolutely the kind of game I would love to sit down and play. But crunching numbers palladium style is absolutely not my thing so I, I think i would have to do a little bit of jury rigging and make things a bit more simple but the sad thing is i really would much prefer having tabletop stuff for this i think a just very rich and interesting setting like this screams out why don't we have more tabletop stuff and that's always been one of my big irks with the palladium stuff and we all know how things went the last time they tried uh getting into the war gaming slash mini slash board gaming world <laughs> we will we will leave robotech uh, unmentioned i'm not going to talk about that because the wound still they still burn deep there don't they so yeah uh supposedly i'm pretty sure pretty sure that there is a sequel slash expansion book that came out for this and that one has been kind of hard to track down and i'm afraid that if i do track it down it's not going to be as cool with the fact that this is signed by the authors uh, but I'm definitely interested in it because there's just so much neat stuff. And I'm hoping that the sequel, expansion, whatever book has a lot of similar background fluff. And if it does, hopefully I can track myself down a copy. If you got any leads, I would love to know. Uh, I know this is long out of print, probably. Not one of their big sellers, obviously not being a Rift's book. But yeah, just something fun that I have had on my shelf for quite some time that I like to pull off every now and then. I'm like, yeah, I haven't talked about Splicers yet. The game that I really wish would have more tabletop stuff. And Lancer. Lancer's the other one. But, yeah. Anyway, with that said, I've been rambling too long. This has been High Lord Tamberlane with Obscurities and Miniatures. Saying thanks for watching, and we will see you back here soon. Bye-bye.